My name is Neil, and, and I have the privilege of taking a few minutes this morning and introducing the new series that will be launched in House Church next week. I want to read one short three verses to you from John's Gospel, and we will introduce it, uh, and then Tyler and I will move into our interview. Uh, John 14, verses 18 through 20. John 14, 18 through 20 is our verses. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Listen, in that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. I want to read that one more time. Verse 20. In that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. As Tyler said, next Sunday, in House Church Sunday, we're launching a brand new series. The title of the series is Connected. And it is an exposition of the four chapters, John 14, 15, 16 to 17. I want to say, I can't think of any more portion of God's word that is more relevant for our day than John 14 through 17. So we're going to stay parked in that for several weeks. I'm just going to do a short introduction this morning. The four gospels reveal that 12 men were handpicked by Jesus of Nazareth and gave away everything they had to follow the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. After following him for three and a half years, they come to Jerusalem. All the gospels tell us about this journey, this final journey to Jerusalem. He had been to Jerusalem each of the previous three years. But now in this final time, they come to Jerusalem and the 12 can feel that something's about to happen. It's in the air. Perhaps they thought that what would occur was when he comes to Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin would fall on their faces and worship and accept Jesus of Nazareth as King Messiah. All four Gospels are care careful to record that Jesus sat down to eat the Passover meal with the twelve that, and that ended his earthly ministry. But they were not prepared for what happened at the Seder. And by the way, it wasn't just a meal. Uh, they didn't just decide to have supper. It was the Passover Seder meal that every Jewish family was sitting down that night to eat and to celebrate as uh, Scripture commands. All four Gospels then tell us what happened at the table. And they were not prepared for it. Jesus, Jesus startled everyone at the table when in the midst of the meal, he announced that one of the 12 would betray him. Even worse was his announcement that followed, not only would one betray him, but he announced that he was going away and where he is going, they cannot follow. Can you imagine how they must have felt having left all to follow him and now to be here having to hear that they cannot follow him to the end? Wouldn't you have liked to have known their table talk that evening after the devastating announcement? We do. It's John 14, 15, 16, and 17. For three chapters, followed by an incredible high priestly prayer in which Jesus comes to the Father on behalf of the twelve, the Messiah unfolds them his plans to leave them and why it was necessary. And it is in the context of that devastating news that he makes the grand announcement that his departure was only temporary. That he himself would be returning. No wonder this section of scripture began with those words. Uh, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. That is not, folks, a second coming text. I believe in the second coming. We believe as a church in the bodily return of Jesus. But that's not a text telling them to wait 2,000 years before he comes back. He was coming soon back to them in a new form. And he told them, you will not be orphaned because that's the way they felt when they heard the announcement. They felt orphaned. 
and you can't blame them. He told them, yet in a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You will also live. In fact, it was actually, he tells them, shockingly to their advantage that he go away because if he didn't go, he wouldn't send the helper to them. Why was it better that he leave and he send the helper in his place? Listen, because the coming of the helper, the coming of the helper meant one thing, that now he would be connected to them in a way they could never have imagined. They would literally experience union with God the Father and God the Son, the Lord Jesus. He spoke of it in mystical terms. You will know that I am in my Father. You are in me. I am in you. Later that evening, he described it, the new relationship they would have with him, that he described it in terms of the metaphor of a vineyard. In that familiar parable we all know in John 15 and love, he said, I am the true vine, John 15, 1. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I am the vine, you are the branches, he told them, demonstrating that they would be able to bear the fruit of the kingdom when they entered the new relationship. And this meant more, folks, than trying to imitate Jesus. It meant, again, they would be in vital union through the indwelling spirit. And this new union in which they would be connected to him in a way much deeper than they ever had, this new union, they would experience a brand new identity which was gifted them through the work of Jesus. To quote Rankin at Wilborn, author of the book Union with Christ, quote, one way to think about the Christian life, not the only way, but a powerful and too little used way, is believing the gospel means having your imagination taken captive and reshaped by a new story. And he tells a little further what he means by a new story. Listen to this for a minute, it's masterful. Rankin Wilburn says, most of us have wondered at one time or another if we were switched at birth. Are these really my parents? <laughs> now imagine your parents are mean and critical then, uh, that you have always been a disappointment to them and they to you. But then one day you find a dusty trunk in the attic. You quickly, quietly pick the lock and open the trunk and discover papers that prove you had in fact been abducted as a baby. These aren't your parents after all. Why, they're criminals. You discover that your real mom was a painter at the Sorbonne in Paris, and your real dad was a Nobel Prize winning scientist and a professional baseball player. And you say to yourselves, of course, this explains everything. I am extraordinary. I knew it all along. You also read that they are fabulously wealthy and have a lavish inheritance waiting for you. It's a fantastic story, but you get it. Such a discovery would cause you to reinterpret everything about your life, where you come from, your true identity, your capacities and capabilities, the resources available to you, your future and your destiny. After that day, your life would never be the same. You would come down from that attic with new eyes for everything and everyone. Your whole life would feel new, changed and invigorated. And here's the thing, it had always been true. It was the truth underlying your life even before you discovered it. It was rooted in history and you have the DNA to prove it. But it didn't change your life until your eyes 
we're opened to it. That's why this series has been decided on. That our eyes may be opened to the fact that we have a different story we now live out. It's not the story of what our father Adam did. It's the story of what our father in heaven and his son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit have done. You have new DNA. You have, are now involved in a different gene pool. What does it mean for living the Christian life? It means that we will be connected. Connectedness leads to great fruitfulness. Connectedness leads to great fruitfulness. That's what this series is about. And each week, a different elder will stand here and unfold to us what this looks like to be connected to the vine. But I want to close this little introduction praying that the reality of this will dawn on each of us as the word of God from this section of scripture is expounded each Lord's day in the coming weeks. Lord, we ask for a miracle. The miracle of transference from our earthly existence into the reality of who we are in Christ. Lord, we do live on this earth and we are earthbound in some respects, but you have done something incredibly amazing. You have revived us in Christ. We died with your son. You raised us. We ascended with your son and we sit with him now at the right hand of the father. And you've sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts to prove it. I pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him in the coming weeks as this series unfolds, as each section of this precious dialogue. Lord, create in your people a hunger to read it, to study it, to go deeper in it, and to experience what it means to be connected to the vine. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. All right. You never know what you're going to get when you come here on Sunday, do you? <laughs> Try to keep you guessing. You know you're going to get truth. Um, but we have something special that we want to do today. And so um, for those of you who don't know um, who we are as a church yet, we are led by an elder team. And currently we, we've had six elders for the last several years. Um, and the elders work together. I, I have the privilege of being the lead elder, which means that I do most of the communication concerning the vision of the church. And I also am responsible for the staff and the way that the staff runs. And I work here at the church full time. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, and Neil has been a part of the team for the current iteration for 10 years now. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But I'd like to start by just asking you, Neil, how did you get into ministry itself? What was that process? Well, uh, I'm in my 50th year as a disciple. This, wow. this year, I've been a believer for 50 years. I walked into a building in November of 1971, literally to go there to cop drugs and pick up girls. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what to say. To that. Don't, go ahead. Don't even try. I did. I mean, at least he's honest. We try to be as honest as we can. Hey, I was 17 years old, unsaved, and living in Miami, Florida. What do you do? And I literally walked out of that building totally transformed. And my first words when I walked out on Biscayne Boulevard, familiar turf, I looked at my brother and I said, everything looks new. And I didn't know 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. But I knew two things happened that night. I knew I would never be the same personally. And I knew somehow, I knew it, even though I, you couldn't have explained it to me because I didn't have the terminology, but I knew that my whole life was going to be involved in promulgating this gospel. Wow. And that's what happened. And I've been doing it for 50 years. Wow. Well, thank you for being faithful to the Lord in that. Amen. <laughs> By the way, just a quick aside, Neil had a birthday on Friday, so he's... Uh, I'm so old. He's so old, but we won't finish that sentence. Although it is his birthday, we could let him finish it. No? 
Okay. All right. We retired that at the Dead Sea. <laughs> we retired, retired it. That's it right. At the, Dead sea. at the Dead Sea. Okay. Anyway, so tell us about how you got connected to Trinity. Yeah, that's an amazing story. I was working with Steve Fado and Sandy Fado in my Alabama. Steve had gone to Muscle Shoals to pastor a church, and we, Shelley and I, left Asheville, North Carolina, and joined the Fados, and we served there. And in 1981 or 82, I can't remember which, I was invited to Knoxville by a podiatrist and his wife to speak in a campus church that I don't think is in existence anymore. This is back in 81 or 82. And uh, Maxine, the woman, said to me, there's a church in town that doesn't have a pastor. Would you speak at the night service? It's Trinity Chapel down on Dedrick. So the first time I ever came to Trinity, I preached there on a Sunday night in 1981 or 82. And uh, they were looking for a pastor, and I really thought it was going to be me. So we came back to Alabama, and uh, Steve went and ministered at the church, and it ended up that Steve and Sandy came here first and, and Pastor Trinity. And I stayed, we stayed in Alabama for another nine years, or seven more years, until 1991. Then we moved here to work with Steve and Sandy and Trinity in 91. And we served for 15 years uh, with them in, in serving the church. And then we moved to Cape Coral, Florida, which is another story. You came and lived with us there for a year. And you had been there. And yeah, you had lived there because your father planted a church there. Yeah. So we ended up serving a church called Christian Fellowship Church, uh, uh, Christian Life Fellowship, rather. And uh, we served there for five years. And in November of 2010, wow. Steve Fedo called me and said, I want you to pray about something. I said, what? He said, pray that you are to come back to Knoxville and lead Trinity. And uh, I prayed for four months. Shelly and I prayed. I knew it was the Lord. And, uh, and uh, I, I'm, I have a partiality to Florida. I like Florida because I grew up there. Yeah. I didn't want to leave Florida just because of weather. Yeah. But in November of, in, uh, November of 19, 2010, we said yes to it. And we moved back here in June of 2011 to resume the lead role. And when I came, God gave me five things that I was to do. Number one, lay a foundation. And I want to say something before I go on. I say five things God gave me to do. None of this would have happened if it wasn't for this team. This team is simply amazing. And before I go on and talk about some of what I was able to do, I want to give a shout out to Mark and Melissa Medley, because I wouldn't be sitting here and this church wouldn't exist if it wasn't for them. So I had five things God gave me a vision to do. Lay a foundation in the gospel, because I knew the church had to be built on the biblical gospel. Uh, build a biblical eldership. Uh, third, to uh, get out of debt, massive debt, which as we sit here this morning, we're totally debt free and we have money in the bank. Hallelujah. Thanks to God and your faithfulness. Number four, revamp our house church structure. And number five, uh, find my replacement. Hallelujah. I love Tyler Lang. And that's what the team was able to do. And it was an accelerator. I had prophetic words from two people in Trinity. Patty was one of them. And uh, an apostle that I know that lives in Minnesota. He said, it's going to be an accelerated pace of change. And that's happened. Awesome. Yeah. And through the years, Neil has had the opportunity to minister to many other churches along the way. And really to have an impact, almost like a fatherly impact in those churches. So how did you get kind of catch the vision for helping other churches? It was totally God because I didn't understand that terminology and I didn't even seek the, to help these churches. I, when I pastored in Alabama in 84 to 91, uh, people would come to our church and connect with me. Some of them were leaders from other churches. They, they'd say, can we have material to listen to? My teaching tapes started being shared. It was the days of the cassette tape. I have a box of them at home if anybody wants them. Uh, <laughs> And, and they would just come out of the woodwork. No, don't, don't go there. I know what you're going to go. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was just a God thing. And I didn't, if you would have said to me, you're apostolic, I wouldn't have understood that term, really. It was maybe the late 80s when I began to learn that verbiage. But I was just helping churches that were coming to me. And it happened. Then we, we moved to, we had moved to Detroit before we lived in Alabama. The same thing happened there in the seventies and, and the same thing happened here. So it's just been part of the calling of God on my life. I understand it now biblically, but it was a God thing. Right. Yeah. So you mentioned the word apostolic, obviously in this area, when you hear the word apostolic, you may have different thoughts 
Um, there is actually a denomination uh, here, and I'm sure in many places called apostolic, and so and that has, you know, that has some things that you might think about. So what is the biblical definition of that term? It's a great question because there is so much confusion. There's actually 28 people designated as apostles in the New Testament. Twelve are called apostles of the Lamb, Peter, James, John. I I have something that will disappoint anybody in this room that was aspiring. No one shall ever be added to that group. That's a closed group. Twelve apostles of the Lamb. Because you start talking about apostles, people get nervous. They think you're talking about canonizing your words and the order of scripture. No, there's 12 men. Yeah, we kind of distinguish that with a capital A. That's right. right. Capital A, the 12 apostles of the Lamb, closed group. They, those guys' names are on the foundation walls of the New Jerusalem. But there's 16 other people called apostles in the New Testament. And they're called by Paul in 2 Corinthians 8.23, apostles or messengers of the churches. Mm. We've got two in this room this morning, besides myself, Mark Medley and Yuri and Olga. Uh, They do, all of us do apostolic work. We're sent from local churches out to help others. And, 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 uh, and, and that's apostolic. So now that's small a, Mm -hmm. none of those people are, are giving words that are, that rise to the level of scripture, nothing of that order. They're apostles of the churches. Well, and you're a part of a ministry called Master Builders, and I think even that name itself kind of helps describe a little more fully what the apostolic, you know, uh, over what it is. Actually. Yeah, because I was I, I taught from that Master Builders before it was Master Builders was the name of my teaching ministry because First right. Corinthians three ten Paul calls himself a wise master builder, and you know what the word in Greek for master builder is? Everybody knows it in the room. You just don't know you know it. It's the Greek word architeknon, from which you get what word? Architect. So apostles are architects. They see the plans. If I'm going to build a house, I'm not going to call the drywall people in first. I'm going to go and sit down with no offense to drywall people. As important as they are, obviously. And, uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to call an architect because I have to have the plans. Well, apostles are just people that have been given plans for the house. And so Master Builders started in Pete Beck's living room in 1996. I was relating to a small group of churches giving some oversight. Another man was and Pete was. And the three of us met in his living room. And Pete had a heart's desire. Pete really launched it. He said, I, I want to bring together churches and give oversight to them. Would you guys join in with me? And we did. In the beginning of Master Builders was the three of us relating to a group of churches. We brought those churches into relationship. That's how Master Builders started. And at this point, Pete and I and Mark Medley are the only ones on the leadership team that aren't senior pastors. Right, exactly. And I was actually able to be at that first kind of uh, official meeting in Asheville right. all those years ago as That's we right. talked about Master Builders and, yeah. and got it kind of off the ground. So, yeah. And by the way, for, if you don't realize this, Trinity is a long-standing member or part of Master Builders Network of Churches. And that's very important for us. Um, there's probably, is there six or seven churches in this region that are a part of Master Builders? I think it's we, six. I think it's six, yeah. yeah. And so we, we relate with each other. The leaders of these churches meet together on a monthly basis to pray for each other, to encourage each other, um, and also to hold each other accountable in some ways. And part of what we do is we give oversight to churches. Oversight is not that we have run the local church. It's another set of eyes that helps the leadership team have accountability because we realize biblically that the church needs the whole fivefold ministry to be properly equipped. And we don't have all those gifts in a local church most of the time. So you have to import them. And we do that by relating to churches. Being in oversight doesn't mean you just go into a church and preach once a year. It means you have an ongoing relationship with the local leadership, the pastor and elders, and that leadership team. Like I'm working with a church that's hurting right now, going through a struggle. And, and that's not the only time you relate, but it's because of relationship I'm able to help them. Yeah, and that's, that's powerful. I know in my life, the apostolic ministry that you've uh, exercised and Pete Beck and Jim McCracken and Clem Ferris and many others have been so, so significant in my life and ministry and just helping me to kind of navigate because at times, especially when I was a, a solo pastor in North Carolina in a smaller church and man, when you feel like you're all alone and you don't have anybody around you, 
you just, you do, you feel isolated and you can easily become discouraged and depressed. And many churches, I don't know what the percentages are, but many churches fail because of the fact that they're not connected in any way to other churches and to exactly those that right. can help them. Yep. So, yeah. yeah. And that's how Master Builders started. We started drawing in pastors and leaders of churches that really didn't have uh, the ability to have access to fivefold ministry and needed the help. Yeah. Very good. So, what is you, what are you feeling like the Lord is is asking of you in this season in your life? I mean, 50 years, that's a long time obviously in ministry. So, what are you feeling now like that God is saying to you, this is what I want you to focus on? Uh, I feel, I knew when the five things that God had asked me to do with the team were accomplished that one day I'd come off the pastoral elder team. I knew that because I knew it when we laid hands on you. And I think that time has come. We, uh, right now, over the last year and a half to two years, I started feeling the Spirit of God saying, prepare, because I'm going to give you a much wider audience through your teaching ministry. Wider than Trinity or Master Builders even. And I, I'm doing that through two uh, pro, uh, projects that I have that I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, so I, I feel that I need the time to be able to devote to developing materials, teaching materials, and wrote, write books and put together a seminar. I think the Holy Spirit's wanting me to do helping churches that are uh, messed up by unbiblical Jewish roots teaching, which I'll talk about in a second. But I feel called to really uh, develop my teaching ministry in a larger sphere so that I can, I hate to use the word market it, but for lack of a better term, to market it on the internet and have more exposure. Yeah. Amen. And so uh, obviously, you know, as you're hearing this, you may not even realize or recognize much of a change moving forward as far as the effect on Trinity itself, because a lot of what Neil has done has been behind the scenes as he's met with the elder team and worked with us. Um, but as this transition occurs, there will be some changes. One of the things is that he has such a heart for each and every one of you. And so he has done a lot of pastoral ministry over the years that he's been here and he's so good at it. And it's just a natural fit for him. And it's not that he's going to stop doing that completely. And I guess we should just kind of quelch any rumors. So are you guys, are you planning on moving or leaving? or doing No, we just right, refinanced our house. We want to die in Knoxville. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, Lord willing, I mean, we don't know. God hasn't spoken to us. We're not, we have no plans. But, we, okay. but if Shelly has her way, we won't, yeah. we won't go back to Florida. I know that. Okay. Yeah. I know that. You want to live first before you die, yes, right? Okay. Yes, I yes. would die. I would go home to my heavenly reward if oh. I told Shelly we're moving back to Florida. <laughs> you could get there even more quickly. I, I hear you. Okay. <laughs> so having said that, then how do you see your role changing at Trinity moving forward? I'm going to move off the elder, the daily pastoral over, elder team and move to a newly formed oversight team, which right now is Pete Beck and me. And there'll probably be another person or two added down the road. Uh, I think my future in Trinity is going to be much more effective giving part that kind of, but the difference about me and the other overseers is I live here. Right. So I have much closer access to the elders. So I would say it this way. Uh, until now, I've given about 75% of my time to Trinity and 25% to uh, master builders and to my t own teaching ministry. What I need to do is invert that and give about 25% of my time to Trinity and 75% to the development of my teaching ministry so I have the time to develop the materials and the things I need to do. So, and I'll, I'm going to be on Jack Wright's level. I'm going to be an elder emeritus because Jack looked so happy when he did it. <laughs> and for two years I've been saying, I need to do this. And Jack, I called, talked to Jean yesterday and so forth. And she gave me permission. She said, it's okay. Uh, but yeah, let, let's add let's add Paul Queen to that number too. So Paul, yeah, Paul we, we don't forget you. We Paul, miss you we don't so bad. Forget you. We love you. Yeah. We miss you so much. Yeah. And so uh, I'm going to be on the oversight team. Uh, and I want to say something uh, about the elder team that I have had the privilege to serve. And I've been on staff now at Trinity over 25 years with a five-year hiatus in Florida. This is the most Christ-exalting godly group of men and women that I've ever worked with. And I have never, and th it's the greatest single ministry experience I've had in 50 years. I mean that. You have no idea how wonderful it is. I think most of you do, but this team is, uh, 
is just a, a group of godly men and women that not only love Jesus, but serve faithfully. And so it's, I, I'm, I'm still going to be around. Tyler asked me to have some input down the road teaching uh, a series for the elders are going through. So I'm going to still be in. And the truth is, uh, I'm going to do three things for Trinity that I'm not stopping. I'll publicly preach from time to time. I will continue to serve and team map with Mark. We have a, a leadership school that we've developed team app. Many of you may not know that Trinity ministry apprentice program. I do the theological and biblical track. Mark does the leadership formation track, and I'm going to continue to teach that. And then those men in the room that I meet with weekly or biweekly, I'm going to continue to do that. That's not going to stop. So I'll still have an active role, but I'm just not going to be carrying the daily burden of the pastoral load. Yeah. Awesome. So you said you mentioned a couple of special projects. So yeah. what are you going to be focusing on right now? as you move into this? Well, this first project was, this, was the second thing we were going to do this year. And because of COVID, we moved it up. There hasn't been a week since March. I don't think. I'm not exaggerating. There has not been a week where I'm not asked about the book of Revelation in lieu of the pandemic. Is the pandemic in the, in the Bible? Is Revelation, is, a, is it one of the seals, one of the bowls? And so we have resurrected a 22-hour, you were there, 22-hour series on the book of Revelation I did in the Florida church before I moved back to Knoxville. And, it, and Tyler helped, uh, we videoed it. We're trying to find the videos, we can't find them. But we have the audios. And so, and I've had some people in the body listening to them, Shelly included with a couple ladies. And, uh, and uh, we're working on a study guide for that. I'm gonna release that. My youngest son, David, is doing editing. We're putting a new intro. And we're gonna release it with a study guide this time in the first half of this year. And then God gave me a, uh, and by the way, the book of Revelation I teach, it's not the traditional view. It's, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, not tank movements in the Middle East. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the view that the church has held for 1,800 years. And only in the early 1800s was a new view proposed. People don't know that. They think what they hear about the rapture and all that is, is biblical. And that's the only view people have had. The first 1800 years of the church, that didn't exist. So really, I'm not teaching anything new. I'm just parroting what most of the church held for uh, or similar views to what I teach. And then I've written a book, which Grant graciously helped me with. And Patty King, where are you? Patty King is incredible as a helper. She, I could not tell you how thankful I am for the work she's done in all of my ministry but also in the editing work she's presently doing on the book. Well, I, God gave me a book 10 years ago. I was invited to a debate. Tyler and Paul went with me, and I debated Jewish roots teachers in an open forum in a local church. And during that, after that time, I felt a call from God. I actually felt it before, but this ramped it up. I felt a call to write a book addressing unbiblical teaching of much of the Jewish roots ministry, uh, churches teaching. Now, much... Jewish roots teaching has validity and it's helpful because our roots are in the Old Testament. But now Gentile believers are keeping the law, keeping the feast days, and they're told that God never abrogated them, that we need to continue to do that. And this book is a clarion call to teachers, false teachers uh, that are teaching that. It's really, somebody said, why do you need this book? Uh, you have the book of Galatians and the book of Hebrews. I said, true, but no one's reading them. <laughs> It's the truth. Uh, so uh, this book comes alongside. I'm not inventing anything new. But it's, I take on all the theology of the Jewish Roots Moon, much of it. And it's a unique book because there's a lot of books out there dealing with the Jewish Roots Moon. But they're very thin and they don't address all the theological issues. I take on a lot of the theology. And it's written to two audiences. And I'll shut up. Number one, because <laughs> we're going to take an offering in a minute. No. <laughs> Hey, I'm Jewish. No, what do we're you want? not. I'm Jewish. Uh, so uh, it's it's written to Christians that are curious about finding out about their Jewish roots and get sucked into unbiblical teaching, and then it's written to church leaders mm -hmm. who are whose churches have been assaulted by unbiblical Jewish roots teaching. Notice I keep saying unbiblical because there is biblical teaching about our Jewish roots that's valid. We don't want to throw that out. Matthew's gospel starts with the genealogy in the Old Testament. Those things we need to know. And the church has become too Gentile in a certain way. We don't know those things. But this book addresses uh, leaders who need help, 
whose churches have been messed around with Jewish roots. So Lord willing, uh, the, if I get the time to do it, I'm, that's why I'm making these decisions to come off the team. And if all goes as planned financially, we're going to release these two projects in 2021. Great. Man, I'm excited. And seriously, you know, he's just giving little snippets here, but you, you're going to want to really dive into both of these resources as they become available because they are absolutely life-changing. Um, especially for those of us who have just heard little, you know, um, whispers through the years and kind of not, sh not known kind of what to do with that. Um, these are really good. So, and by the way, we do believe in the second coming of Jesus, right? Yep. Yeah, that is, that is, I said the, that, yes. yeah, exactly. So you, just wanted to make sure we there's no uncertainty concerning absolutely. that. We do believe that the Bible teaches that, and we are all looking forward to the soon coming of our redeemer. And Amen. I want to say, this is our home church. There's no rumors out there, but I want to quell them. There's not a problem. We're not leaving. When I'm not traveling, I will be here. Yeah. And Shelly and I will be here. This is our home church, and we love you guys so much. Thank God. And the elder team, we have um, reluctantly in some ways, because we realize what we're losing, um, and we're going to really feel the effects of this because of elders, elders meetings and Neil's presence with us. You know, just kind of, there's times where he would say, okay, guys, <laughs> let's, let's welcome the Holy Spirit back or let's, uh, you know, let's get back on track or, you know, have you considered this or have you thought about this? He still has the, the right to come to any elders meeting that he wants to and we're going to have him involved, you know, at least once a month in teaching us as an elder team. So he's not going to be removed in any way um, from, his, from the importance of what God's called him to do but he is going to be released from the responsibility that he's carried um, to really, and, and I have to be honest, you know, without Mark, all the guys, but without Mark and Neil specifically, this last year when I was so sick, you know, you would not have been able to be cared for the way that you were. And so I appreciate, again, the effort and, and the hours, and it, it wasn't just a job they were doing, this is their heart. And so we so appreciate that. So we'll wrap things up, but how are you, um, I'm sure that there are some people who are questioning or wondering, how are you going to fund what you're doing, the, the financial side of it? Yeah, uh, I'm going to ask partners, I want to develop over this year a partner base of people that would be willing prayerfully to consider partnering with us. Uh, first of all, I need two things. Number one, I need a prayer partners. I want to ask, and our team led by D here, we were with them this morning before the service. They're so wonderful. I don't know if you know yes, that sir. there's a prayer team that prays faithfully early before every service on Sunday, and they pray for whoever, whatever elders speaking that morning, and they do it with great zeal and heart. And so I'm, they're going to continue to pray for me, but I'm coveting prayer more than anything else for open doors. And then uh, pray, pray for our finances because we're going to be asking people to prayerfully consider to partner with us financially. And you can do that. I think it's on the website. It's on the screen. My, I have a tax-exempt organization called uh, uh, as the Ezra Project. It's tax-exempt. Anything given to it is tax-exempt, tax-free. So people can give to that. And you get to that by going to neilsilverberg.com. I blog regularly, although I'm really behind. I'm going to catch up this week. But I blog regularly at neilsilverberg.com. And if you hit the Donate tab, uh, it, you, it'll take you and you, the money is deposited into Ezra, so it's tax-free. Uh, and I just need people to prayerfully consider coming alongside us and doing that. Yep. Amen. And we as a church, I want you to know that for this year, for 2021, we have set aside some monies that are going to Ezra Project and so that we're able to help meet a large portion of that need for 2021 because we did not want Neil to step out and to begin to try to do this without having any kind of backing. And one of the things you need to know, this is the type of church that we are. There are going to be times in the future where other leaders are going to be called by God to do other things. And as they step into those roles, we want to support that. We want to bless that. And we also want to give them permission to see if other people feel led to connect with that particular ministry. Now, we understand, we all understand that biblical uh, giving starts with tithing, which is giving the first fruits that God gives us to the local body that we are connected to. But then above and beyond that, there are offerings that can be used in so many different ways. 
And so it may be that God would speak to you to give a one-time gift or to give monthly or quarterly or whatever the case might be to Ezra Project. So you wouldn't be giving just to Neil as a person, as important as that would be, or to Neil and Shelley as a couple. You would be giving to this ministry that is producing these types of materials, okay? And also, um, you know, this is just the beginning. I feel like the Lord's going to give him many more ideas that will move him toward the future. So, um, so in, basically, if you have any questions, obviously this isn't the, the best format for that. But if you have any questions, please send me an email, tyler at tcckinox.com, and I'll, I'll get back to you on Tuesday uh, with, with an answer. Um, and uh, also just, Neil, Neil is with us. He is a part of us. He will continue to be in an oversight role here at Trinity. I don't want you to miss here and miss here what we're saying. And we're excited about the next steps for him because we believe that God's really going to use him. And you by agree the with way, that? this elder team did not ask me to do this. I went to the elder team because it wasn't their idea. It was mine, but they concurred that it was God. But but uh, but uh, this was not them coming to me and saying, you need to step off the team or anything like that. Yeah. I could have stayed on the team for till the millennium. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to the millennium. Wow. Did that. No, maybe not that. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> All right. The tribulation. To the <laughs> Don't get me started on that. All right. So anyway, we'll conclude this. Thank you so much, Neil, for Thank taking you. the time to, to do this interview. Let's pray for Neil. If you would have, if the elder team could just come quickly and, and just pray a blessing over him. Again, he's not leaving, but he is changing, adjusting, adapting to the new role that God has for him. And so that means we're adjusting and adapting as well. And uh, I'm going to let ask Mark to lead us in prayer. Father, we're so grateful to you for Neil, and God, he's such a gift to us, Lord. I, first of all, we glorify you and thank you. Um, just that uh, the fact that we are so much richer having had him in our lives these years, Lord, and looking forward to the, the continuation of that, but also excited, Lord, about what you're doing in his life, Lord, and that we're able to release him to that and to support that. So, God, we're grateful. Lord, we pray your blessing on Neil and Shelly, Lord, for your provision and for everything uh, that you have planned for them to go forth, Lord, in, in power and in protection, Lord, and for their family. We pray your blessing on their family, God. We pray for your uh, blessing and fruitfulness from this work, Lord, that as they are connected to you, Lord, that much fruit, Lord, that you spoke about would come forth through his ministry. We know that he has a lot to give to a lot of the body of Christ. So, Lord, we pray for open doors. We ask for you to go before him and prepare, prepare the way for you to connect him in the right places. Lord, that, Lord, that they're, they're key people in your kingdom that uh, he needs to be connected to, that you would, by your spirit, connect him to them, Lord. And um, as a church body, we bless him, Lord, and we bless Shelley. And as a church body, we thank you, Father, for what you've given to us through him, Lord. We give you praise for what's going to happen. And thank you, Lord. We're excited to see what's going to happen from this move. We give you praise for that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Bless you, Lord. All right. Okay. Um, we're going to conclude here in just a minute. Um, one very important announcement while I'm doing this. Is there anybody that has an example of how the Lord kind of quickens you to uh, reach out to somebody in the Help My Neighbor initiative this week. Anybody have a, just a quick story about an example of, of how God gave you a chance to bless somebody or to help somebody? Debbie? Come. You need to come up here so they can see you on the camera. Sorry. And as she's coming, I just want to let you know that the, the annual March for Life is happening today in downtown Knoxville as it happens in many places around the country and around the world. Um, it will start at 2 p.m., and you need to go to the, I believe it's the 11th Street parking garage, and you'll start there. There's a radio station that we're going to tune into, and you'll get instructions there, and then we will get out and walk the area and pray, and we're not standing against something. We're standing for something. We're standing for life, um, and so we'd love to have you join us. The church van will be leaving here around 1.15 or so, 
So if you would like to ride with us, you can come and meet us here. If not, we'll just meet you down there downtown, and we'll look for each other. Maybe we could walk together. So I'm going to do this so it's easier for you to understand me. I met a uh, family about two weeks ago. Actually, two weeks ago, somebody told me there was a need. It was a family living in the Walmart parking lot and they live in the car. And um, so at that time, they had asked me if Trinity had anything available. I had not been able to come to the first services, so I didn't know that there was anything available. I received Tyler's message that he sent out via the internet, and I, I felt really comfortable and moved that if I tried to do something for this family that I could have some kind of backing and support because I knew I couldn't do this by myself. Anyways, we do have right now this particular family. Um, they are now set up with housing applications based on their income. Yesterday, I was able to get the sister who is unemployed also. There's one person employed, excuse me, out of this whole family. And there's a, a sister that's unemployed that has uh, disabilities, but I hooked her up with Goodwill yesterday, so today she goes in for her interview. Her son is out of school, he's 17 years old, and he has no school to go to at this particular time. We hooked him up with the Anderson County school system. They still don't have a place to live, but they have hope. And that's what they didn't have before. We've prayed with them. We. I'm the only person. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've prayed with them um, innumerable times. They may have a belief in God, but I know they don't have a personal relationship. But it is so evident to me that when we finish praying, that the hope sparks and they step in to do the next thing that they have to do to have a home. And, um, and you can just see the peace of God is working in this family that was very, very distraught in the very beginning. So it's really been awesome that God placed this in my pathway. And then when I saw this from the church, it was like, I know the church will help me and guide me wherever I need to go. So reach out, guys. Reach out. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> And this lady, in the meantime, has been caring for her mother, who just recently had surgery and has been trying to recover, and her husband, who has been uh, not, not doing well physically either. So what I'm, I'm not trying to, to, you know, I'm just saying open your, we can open our eyes and look, and the opportunities are abundant, abundant. We can't do everything. You don't need to feel the pressure to do everything. You just need to be considering what's the one thing that the Lord's asking of me right now. And be faithful with that. What a th I'm so thankful. What a great story. Amen. So I'm going to just pray over you and release you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.